Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. God, your word is force. And your word is love. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light. On to my path, I would have I had. Well, welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk as we continue in our look at Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Uh, we're, we're glad this is the 14th part of that study. And unlike I thought last week, I doubt that we'll finish tonight, but we're going to give it a shot anyhow. We're going to just go as the Spirit of God leads us. Before we do, I'm, I'm joined here as no, usual by Alice and Mark. All right, before we start in our Bible study and pick up where we left off, let me ask Brother Mark here to lead us in a prayer, asking God's blessing on our time together. Oh Lord, we just thank you for being able to get together tonight and to hear your word and have it become part of our lives. Just bless the people that hear it and bless us here to proclaim the good news. Amen. 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 Uh, well, as I said, this is our 14th part. And I, I'm kind of, you know, I have little titles that I put on. Right? I, I, this one is, I'm calling, uh, A Quick Start Guide to Life. Now, if you've ever bought software programs, oftentimes they come and it's got a quick start guide. Yes. You know, to get into it real quick. Well, uh, that's, that's what we're going to look at tonight. Because that's what Paul has done, the Apostle Paul. And one of the things we have to watch and be prayerful about is that we don't take the Word of God out of context. And all too often in preaching and teaching, you know, you get you know, people pick a verse and we'll just teach on a verse, and you lose the historical context of what, what's going on. And that's very important. So it's something I try and bring in a little bit. You can't study Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, which, by the way, is his very first letter, and his earliest letter, therefore, all right? without understanding Paul's story. But ultimately, it's not about Paul's story. It's about the Lord's story. It's about his story that we gather, right? His story. History. His story. History. Uh -huh. That's where history came from. Because story. his story, or history, of what's going on here is important to get a full understanding of what's going on. Bear in mind... And if you've been with us in the studies of Thessalonians, you may remember in the beginning we talked about this. And those studies are available online, so you can go back and watch them there. But, but Paul is on his second missionary journey. And he's going from Philippi, where he is harshly mistreated, beaten unlawfully, unjustly, and thrown into jail with, with Silas, right? In the story in Acts 16, where he's imprisoned. Uh, and God does this mir miracle, shaking the earth and letting him out. Mm -hmm. And from there, he, he is literally kind of chased out of town because that and goes to Berea. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. He goes to, to Thessalonica, Thessalonica, right? And here, he's only there for three weeks. His entire time there is roughly three weeks when he is again, there's such an uproar in the town that he is forced to leave. And from there he goes to Berea, from Berea he goes to Athens, from Athens to Corinth. And it's in Corinth that he sits down and writes this letter. So it's not long after he's been in Thessalonica. But understand that he had a very brief period there with them to impart the gospel, which people, you know, so many people accepted, and that he started this, was used of God to start this church there. So now, We've looked at this and talked about that persecution that followed him uh, into Athens and into, into Corinth, all right? So he has told them a lot, okay? I, I, let me just start where we, where we left off by reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Paul writes, Therefore encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are also doing. What he's doing here right now is... He is not having had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with them. He is now sending them back basic instruction on how to live this new life that they have come to in Christ Jesus while he was there. All right? 
So he didn't get time to do a lot of study late now in Corinth. He spent a year and a half in Corinth teaching. He didn't have that time in Thessalonica. So this causes him to write his first letter and send back. And he's giving them, okay, you accepted the Lord. New life in Christ Jesus should lead to a new lifestyle. Right. All right? Mm -hmm. Well, here's his instruction on what that new lifestyle should look like. All right? So he has already told them. Remember, we, again, we've talked about this. We've talked about the second coming. We've talked about persecution. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the coming, the wrath to come. We've talked about the Lord who is to come. So now we know what is coming, we know why it's coming, and we know that we don't know when it's coming. Okay, that's what we've studied over the past 13 weeks, right? So now here's Paul's prescription for a life prepared for that coming. For that coming. And I was thinking as I was praying about this this morning, you know, I, I had the opportunity, I've, I've flown, I've flown, you know, as a private pilot and flown as an air crewman in the Navy. And one of the things that probably has guided my adult life since then is the concept of checklists, okay? If you're going to fly, there are things that you do ritualistically, never failing to do them to avoid danger. There is a pre-flight before you get, especially like in a light aircraft, or well, any aircraft. I mean, even in a commercial airliner, it is the pilot who has ultimate responsibility to make sure that everything is done the way it's supposed to be done. In a light aircraft, before you get in that airplane, you, there's pre-flight operations. Sometimes you have to file a flight plan and tell them where you're going, how you expect to get there, and so forth. Otherwise, you walk around the aircraft and you test the control surfaces. You make sure that the fuel is filled. That's your responsibility. This is pre-flight stuff, so, all right? And then, when you get in and start to take off, there is an absolute rigid checklist for taking off and landing. And you don't leave this to chance, and you don't leave it to memory. No. You go through the checklist each and every single time. Okay? Well, what Paul has done here for the church, for the Thessalonians, and importantly, what God has used him to do for us, is to give us a checklist mm -hmm. on how to live a life prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Mm -hmm. So... And that's why he says, therefore. Therefore is a, an incredible word when you stop and think about it. Where are you? In, in verse 11. Chapter 5, okay. verse 11. It starts off, therefore. Well, therefore means, okay, because of all that I have said up to now, right? Because of what I've said, we're going to, therefore, we're going to do this. So he's telling you because of what he has already written to them. Again, ab about the coming of the Lord, about the, the tribulations that they're facing. He says, okay, now, because of that, here's what I want you to do. And it starts with this. Number one, encourage one another and build up one another. All right, so here's Paul giving instruction on how you live this new life in Christ Jesus. And we really need to understand, this is a checklist for our lives. Yes. And the first thing that he says is encourage one another and build up one another. This is a theme throughout the New Testament. It's a theme throughout the Word of God. In Hebrews 3.13 it says, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So what he's saying is, in order for us to be protected from the deceitfulness of sin, we need each other in our lives to encourage us. Right? We can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. That's why it says, you know, forsake not the assembling together. So you need good fellowship. And I'm not just talking about meeting in a building once. I am talking about people in your lives, brothers and sisters in your lives, who will love you enough to be that fellowship that you need, encouraging you, correcting you, admonishing you, all right? Building you up. Building you up. Because that's the purpose of it all. Mm -hmm. The purpose is not, not to condemn, not to... You know, say, okay, I'm better. The purpose of it is to build up. Okay? Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4.29, and he said this, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Let me wow. just take a little pause there. Because if ever we lived in a time when there is filth pouring from the mouth of man, it really? is today. It is horrific. Mm. You know, not to distract myself too much, but I can remember when Alice and I were first married, and so I'm going back away. 
we'd go out someplace, we'd be sitting in a restaurant, if I heard somebody curse in the table next to us, I'd get up and walk over and say, hey, there's a lady present, watch your mouth. If I did that today, I'd never eat, <laughs> not us. I mean, because I'd spend all my time running around from table to table, saying, you know, Where's, give me a bar of soap, let me wash your mouth out. There's just no shame, there's just, we have become so accustomed to unwholesome words coming out of people's mouths that it just it's become part of the world that we live in. It's like living it's a cesspool, quite frankly. But it doesn't only mean profanity. No 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 unwholesome. Okay. Well let me proceed then, right? Mm -hmm. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. That's back to the building up. According to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. It's about if you're not saying something that's building people up, don't say it. You don't want to go around moaning and groaning and complaining. That's a different thing. Grumbling, okay. grumbling. Okay. No, no, but that's 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 something different because this is in conversation, right? Okay. We're supposed to be building one another up. We're supposed to be blessing one another and cur and and encouraging. God has given us a mouth to bless, not to curse. All right. Um, the other thing is we don't we don't understand cursing, all right? Because cursing in this country, I did a I did a, a thought of the day about this a number of years ago, because we think of cursing as just this filth that flows. Cursing is actually trying. I was going to say wishing. It is literally trying to speak evil into somebody's life, and it, so it's quite the opposite of of using your tongue to build up. It says in Proverbs that the tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. The tongue of the righteous is a fountain of life. That's the way we're supposed to be speaking, all right? Unfortunately, there's not enough of that going around. You need to be speaking blessings. Well, and this is something for all of us, and we'll see this where it says, when Paul says, let a man examine himself. We need to look at the way we're speaking. Because, it, remember this, Jesus said out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's coming out of your mouth is what's in your heart. And, and maybe you ought to stop and take a little pause and see if sometimes what's coming out of your mouth ought to shock you. Shock you and shame you. Or are you proud or blessed by what's coming out of your mouth because it's affecting positively other people, right? All right. But it's to build one another up. And there's a little bit of a paradox here, all right? And, you know, you s spoke to this. I want to read, this is Philippians 2.12. Paul wrote and said, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, he's writing this to the Philippians. Remember, in, in this history, he was in Philippi, wound up in jail quickly, and then had to leave the town. So now, you know, what he had imparted there, he's saying, now in, in my absence... You got to work out your own salvation in fear and trouble, right? I'm not there to do this or anything for you. You've got to do it. So God has a, God has spoken through the apostle here to tell us we need to to work this thing out ourselves. We need to get our life right. He wrote to the to the Romans and said, you know, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a responsibility that God has given us. We are the work of His hands. Hallelujah. The work he has begun in us, he is able to complete. But the fact is, we got to participate in this. There are things that we have to do. The Word says that we are to humble ourselves. You don't want God to have to do that for you. Humble yourself, and then he will exalt you. But having said that, that this is this, this responsibility on your part to grow in him, right? Paul also wrote to the Corinthians and said, But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. In other words, now, now on, on the other hand, he is saying, we absolutely need each other. We can't do this on our own. God doesn't expect us to do this on our own. When Jesus Christ sent his disciples out, he sent them out two by two. For, for two are better than one for their labor, it says in Ecclesiastes. A three-stranded cord is not easily broken. We need each other. We need to be in each other's lives because you don't always have that apostle there or somebody who is, you know, building up your life, right? Mm -hmm. 
Think of this in the very beginning. I'm going way back now. Talk about history. Cain and Abel. Right? Cain and Abel. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And Cain said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, that was the attitude of the first murderer. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, the answer there is kind of rhetorically, yes, you are. Because Paul, again, writing to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 12 says, And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. We are part of the same body. We are spiritually interconnected in ways that we have not yet begun to understand. So it's like, you're not doing me a favor when you encourage me. Unless you want to say, okay, my hand is doing a favor to my stomach when it brings food to my mouth. That's just the way God designed the body to function. All right? The hand has to reach out and take the food, put it in the mouth. The mouth has to chew it and swallow it for it to get to the stomach where it's needed, where it can then be distributed to the whole body, right? This is God's design. It says in Psalm 139, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't think most of us, that's, we don't think about things. I mean, you know, we, there's a lot that goes on in our lives that we don't think about. As I sit here and speak to you right now, my heart is pumping. Thumpity thump thump thump. I know that for a fact. I had an EKG this week. Thump 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 thump. My my lungs are going whoom shoom whoom shoom. Taking air in and out. All this stuff is going on here. I'm not conscious of it. I'm not thinking. I don't need to think about it. We shouldn't have to need to think about it. It should be that almost like an involuntary muscle. It's just a, a, the, the natural order. order of things that we are working with each other, building each other up, encouraging one another, correcting one another when necessary. That should just be the way our life is, all right? That's the first thing that Paul says, okay? So his, his first priority is make sure that you're encouraging one another and building one another up. It's about our relationship. The apostles came to Jesus and said, Master, teach us how to pray. And the first thing he says, okay, when you pray, pray like this. Pray our Father. In other words, we're joined together in a prayer. All right? So that's why I'll read verses 12 and 13. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you may esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Okay, so now we've talked about the relationship that you have your responsibility to work out your own salvation if you're in trouble, your responsibility to work as a group. But God has, as Paul wrote twice, appointed in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And for, for what? For the building up, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body. So there are people like that. Now, the thing is, you have to understand, you're supposed to appreciate those who diligently labor among you. The word says that the worker is worthy of his hire. Okay? The thing is, the appreciate... Now, the, the Greek word there is aido. And it, 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 it means literally to look, to see. All right? Um, it's not to heap honors on them. It's not to carry them around. It's not to bow down before them. It is to be focused on them is what it literally means in the Greek. Because that word that's used here, it's translated appreciate uh, in my New American Standard. Going back to the birthday boy, I think the King James says to, to look upon those, right? Because that's what it literally means. Now think about this. In your instruction on how to live your life, when the church was doing well, and this is, speaking of history, it's in a unique moment in history, in Acts chapter 2. Because it is, the, it is the one place and the one time that you truly see the body of Christ functioning as it should. Right? They were of one mind, of one heart. They held all things in common, not, nobody claiming anything to be their own. There was no need. There was no need. 
But in that, it says in Acts 2.42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayer. So they were focused on the not so much on the apostles of as the teaching. apostles' teaching. The what they had, the apostles had received this from the Lord, and they were passing it on. That's their ministry. That's the ministry of a teacher, and that's one of the reasons it's a heavy responsibility. Yes. This is why James writes and says, "Let not many of you become teachers, for by this you incur a stricter judgment." So it's not about exalting those people. But it is about paying attention to them, understanding the ministry that God has called them to, and looking at them, paying attention, devoting themselves to the teaching of the Word of God. Because ultimately we're going to see it always comes back to the Word. Right? In 514, it says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Alright? So, so now it's about, okay, we've got a function. First of all, is my first of all is my personal relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Second is my relationship with you guys with the with the body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then third, my relationship with that structure that God has put in the church, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Mm -hmm. And then Paul is saying, but okay, you're going to have unruly, you're going to have faint-hearted, you're going to have weak people among you. Be patient with them. Okay, don't be judge. You know, don't be judgmental of. Uh, I, go ahead. Well, take faint harder hardness. I was gonna say, don't be judgmental of persons that are having a crisis in faith. Even John the Baptist had a crisis in faith. Well, yes, he said yes. to encourage him. Yes. Well, I'll give you scripture. Mm -hmm. There's a thought. Paul wrote in Romans 14, 1, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Right? So, it's that doesn't mean you accept, if they're in error, that you accept their error. But, you know, we're supposed to patiently correct them with the Word of God. Right? Not with our opinions. Yes. So, it, it's back to the first thing. Right? Encourage one another, building one another up. That's what this is about. Building each other up. And we're talking about, okay, those. The, the, the ones that you don't like so much in the body. Why? Because they're not, they're not, they're unruly. That means they're not ruly. That's like, you know, they're a little chaotic. Uh, yes, they're, they're faint hearted. They're weak, right? Mine says undisciplined. Well, undisciplined is, is a good word. And, you know, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, remember that word means disciplined, right? You're being discipled, you're being disciplined by the Lord. So now it's saying, okay, don't get this attitude about, oh, them. Because remember, it says, going on, in Romans 12, verse 3, it said, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. So one of the things you have to be careful about, is that we don't start judging others, other people's faith according to what we think our level of faith is. Alright? We're not the test of things. Jesus Christ is the test of things. And as Paul will say as we get along in here, we've got to examine ourselves. We have to look at ourselves. Okay? So, don't, don't start pushing people out because they don't live up to your standards. Before you start even looking at other people that way, Check to see if you're imitating Jesus Christ. Because Paul was the one who had the boldness and correctly to say, be an imitator of me even as I am of Christ. And he wrote to the Ephesians and said that, you know, therefore, we're supposed to be imitators of God, beloved children. So we should look like Jesus. And if you don't look like Jesus, be careful how you speak about others. All right? This is, this is instruction for living the life in fellowship. Okay? Well, let me just ask you... Uh, well, make a statement on this okay. about the um, the faint-hearted, the unruly, the weak. Be patient with them. It, it's hard to when you have somebody that you've been sharing the word with for over and over and over, and you're not seeing anything coming out of their mouth but fear and 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 not faith. 
how, I mean, how, I mean, shouldn't the word be doing something to them yes. immediately? Well, or, I don't know about immediately, all right? I mean, the, the word has the power to change lives immediately. Right. People have the power to block the word of God, right? One of the things is, and we've talked about this so much in our studies, is accepting the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Right. Understanding, you know, it all goes back to the word. That we're not to lean on our own understanding, it says in Proverbs. And in Psalms, it talks about how the word is a lamp to our feet, a light like our path. And how, how, it says in the beginning of that, Psalm 119, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. If you're going to keep your life lined up with God's will, you have to keep it lined up with God's word. And his word has to be something that you surrender to and submit to. Because otherwise, you are, you are denying the lordship of Jesus Christ. Because what Lord means is he's the boss. If he tells you to do something, you're supposed to do it. You know, if you work someplace and your boss says, I want you to go do this, and you say, no, I don't feel like doing that today. Uh, brother, check out, I don't know how unemployment works, but you better start checking out how unemployment works. Well, the, the application of this may seem difficult because here you have a situation where Jesus th doesn't make suggestions. No, it's commands. It's Every word is a command, right? This is the instruction of the Lord who is calling you to do something. So even the things you're talking about, when God says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Be anxious for nothing. And that happens so much throughout both the Old and New Testaments. I mean, from Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation 22, you see God not just encouraging us, but commanding us not to fear. Why? Because fear is the opposite of faith. And anything not done in faith is sin. So we need to lovingly and patiently correct these people, but we do need to speak the truth in love, as Paul writes. And we need to confront them with this sin and make, make it clear to them that this is sin. Now we live in a time when the church, too much of the church, too much of what is called the church, avoids talking about sin because they don't want to turn people off. Well, that's ridiculous. The, the scriptures are filled with talking about sin with a purpose. The purpose is to eradicate it, mm -hmm. to get it out of here. Let's get this stuff no out of here, to get it, get rid of it, right? So, but, but it's really important because this is what Paul is doing now. This is Paul moved, not, not speaking from himself, no. but moved by the Spirit of God, spoke of God, the instruction of God, the command of God. These are not suggestions. These, this is God telling you, here's how I want you to live. Period. So in verse 15, he goes on and says, See to it that no one repays another evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another for all, and for all people. Now, early on, we talked about this whole thing about and for all people. Our love is supposed to extend not only to the brethren, but to all people. And here... When he says, "Don't you know? Don't repay evil for evil." That includes those out there. See, I told you so. <laughs> Jesus prayed on the cross, and he said, "Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing." How can you justify not forgiving others? Oh, but wait, wait, wait! You don't understand. That person jumped ahead of me and took a parking space in Walmart that I was headed for. And that was worse than this. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's I mean, you know, we take offense, and by the way, if you take offense, you're sinning. What could be worse than being innocent of a crime and then no, no, having capital okay. punishment? Okay, we don't need to discuss that. I mean, <laughs> the simple fact of the matter is there, there is no... There is nothing worse. Nothing. Now, what do you went through? Nobody... There has never been an injustice that compares to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Never. And there can't be. I mean, here, you know, Pontius Pilate says, I find no guilt in him, crucify him. I mean, it, you can't get more in unjust. There can't be a greater injustice than that. There can't be a greater mocking than what was done to Jesus Christ. It's not just the crucifixion. It is the horror of the whole trial. It is the mockery that took place. It is the crown of thorns. It is the whipping. 
It is the carrying his own cross. It is every bit of that. And yet, at the end of that, hanging there, he looks out and says, Father, forgive them. He prays for them, for their forgiveness. And, and we justify our holding grudges. grudges and offense against people because, oh, you don't understand what this person did to me. It makes me want to cry. I mean, what's the matter with us? You can't live a godly lifestyle and hold unforgiveness in your heart. And if you think I'm wrong about that, go back to the Sermon on that Mount, that most radical sermon ever preached, when Jesus said, okay, here's the way you should pray. Remember I just yes. mentioned a little while ago. Yes. You want to pray? Here's how you should pray. And one of the prayers is, is when you're praying to the Father, here's what I want you to ask God. Here's what I want you to ask your Father. Father, forgive me the same way I forgive others. Whoa! Are you sure you want to pray that? Well, Jesus said you should pray that. But Jesus is saying that, knowing that you should be able to pray that. Because he has given you the power to forgive others, regardless of what they have done to you. Anything that they have done to you. Why? Because it says in Romans chapter 5, that the love of God has been poured out into your heart through the Holy Spirit. That very same love that empowered Jesus to forgive his enemies on that cross can certainly give you the power to forgive somebody who cut you off on the way to work yesterday. Otherwise, brother, let a man examine himself. If you're not doing that, you better get on your face before God and get that straight before God so you can be living a godly lifestyle. Okay? All right, so that makes up my pre-flight. <laughs> now I want to get into now for the flight. First Thessalonians five sixteen. Rejoice when things are going right. Nope. Rejoice a lot of the time. Nope. Rejoice some of the time. Nope. Other than here it says rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. Oh. It doesn't say when. And I was reading Exodus in the beginning well, of the Bible. Before you go on, uh, well, I'm. It says rejoice always. Okay, go ahead. That's what he said. <laughs> One of the things that God was trying to teach them just after they got out of e Egypt, the opposite of rejoice is murmuring and complaining. Yes. And what did they not stop doing? Murmuring and complaining. And that leads to doubt, which led to them not getting into Israel, the promised land. So, the, you know, Joyce you have a good voice. story of give thanks in all things, and give, and giving thanks is kind of like Different re verse. rejoicing. Different but are they similar? Yeah, they are similar. Well, let's wait till we get to that verse okay. before we do that, right? Um, but, but you're right. I mean, that, that's a fact. Rejoicing always means that there is no time. This is the Word of God. There is no time when you shouldn't be rejoicing. What does rejoicing mean? Right? It means to, to it means a proclaimed joy and gladness. Right. It's not just having the joy and gladness. It's proclaiming the joy. It's it's, it's making evident well, the joy and gladness. Rejoice always. That, but does that mean that you have to feel? Oh, Did, oh, I, okay. Just he said something about the. Acts 16, where Paul and Silas was in the jail? I they doubt if they like felt it. like it. No, uh, I promise you that Jesus Christ, it says he was tempted in all things as we are. He was truly man. He did not feel like saying, Father, forgive them. That was a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. Love is a choice. Rejoicing. You want to know something? God is pro-choice. Everything is about the choices that you make. Bear in mind, I mean, way back when, you're talking about, you know, in the time when they came out of Egypt, right? Moses brought them out by the hand of God. And one of the first things that happens in Deuteronomy is God said, I, I and I call heaven and earth to, to bear witnesses. I set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose life. It's about the choices you make. God is not going to make that choice for you. He's given you the power to make the right choice. It has nothing to do with the way you feel. And herein lies the rub, as yes. Billy Shakespeare once said. It, the problem is we have been, we are being conditioned by the world mm -hmm. to live our lives based on our feelings. Yes. And it's not about feelings. It is about spiritual choices that you make. You have the power. Why? 
Because joy is not what you got for Xmas, for Christmas this year. Joy is not, uh, joy is not about, you know, how they treated you at work today. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit within you. Okay? It is God's work from within, not the world's work from without, that gives you reason to rejoice. And as I said, rejoicing is not just having a feeling or or a sense of gladness and joy, right, right. but it is outwardly showing that joy and that gladness in your life. Proclaiming. Proclaiming. Why? You have reason. Because, you know, regardless of how things went at work today, if you have been saved by the shed blood of the Lamb upon that cross, mm -hmm. then your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what it's about. And when the apostles came back at one point to Jesus and said, Oh, boy, you should see. It was one, oh, it, oh, it was good. It was exciting. We were casting out demons. We were doing this. We were healing. And Jesus said, Whoa. He said, rejoice. rejoice over this, that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. No matter how you feel today, no matter how things went, if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, brother, you got reason rejoice. to rejoice. Yeah. And this is what we talked about so much last week. It's about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope that we have, that we have cause for this joy. All right? I just, you know, I was just thinking that it was the rejoicing that impressed God so much that he moved to have the earthquake. And way back in Acts 16. I, 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 have, I have difficulty arguing with, you know, what did, what did you actually do? Okay. Did, did, did what God, God? God is moved, God is moved by prayer. And rejoicing or giving praise is a form of worship. So God was pleased with that worship and he answered their prayer, even though they were not asking him for anything. Because he was rejoicing. Okay. This is a, a, we could do hours and hours of study on this. He did not so, Okay, no. God, God, God has obligations. Okay. He what is God his word to perform? He is, it. You're right. He is obligated because he watches over his word to perform. He cannot lie. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if he has if he has said Promise, something, it'll happen. He is obligated to do that. Not not that it's, he's doing it against his will. No. I mean, his word is his will. It is the expression of his will. So here's what he wants to do. Jesus wanted to heal people. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But it says in his own hometown he was unable to do that because of their lack of belief. Here's an amazing thing about free will. And we have free will. Right? I mean, that's a lot of people debate that. But the fact of the matter is we do. I think the most amazing thing is that God has given us power to say no to an all-powerful God. We can, we can say no to God and cause him to withhold his blessings in our life. But that also means that if we have the power to to cause him to withhold it. We have the power to, to give him opportunity to bring it. And it's not like we're convincing him to do something that he doesn't want to do. It's just our following the Word of God opens the gates for him to be able open the windows of heaven. to open the windows of heaven. That's, that's exactly right. You know, um, and we'll see here, we get to it tonight, I don't know. One, one of the verses I want to talk about is where Paul writes in, to the Ephesians and says, don't give the devil an opportunity. Right. Well, the other side of that coin is that we have the power to give God an opportunity. When we are walking obedient to the Word, we are giving God opportunity to reveal Himself in our lives, to do things in our life. All right? So it was Paul and Silas' faithfulness in that jail cell in Philippi that empowered God in that sense to release what was going on. Um, and I guess so that's a, a whole different subject, and I really can't go all the way down there. But, but you have, you know, it is your walking in faith that gives God that opportunity to do what He wants to do in your life, what He has said that He wants to do. And like you said before, one of the verses he, again, writing to the Philippians, in Philippians two fourteen and fifteen, Paul said, "Do all things without grumbling or disputing." so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. So it is our lack of grumbling and complaining 
that shows, that sh shines that light out in that crooked and perverse generation, out in the dark world. You know, so we have to really be prayerful and train ourselves. Because it's a response. It's how do you respond to situations in your life. When something goes wrong, you have a choice of how you will respond. You can respond like the world does, mumbling, grumbling, groaning, and complaining, cursing. Woe is me. Or the poor me's. Or you have the power to trust in God and think of it as an opportunity for God. And I promise you we'll get and talk to that. Uh, okay. So, we want to do things. We want, we want to have joy. We want to be glad. And we want to do it visually and verbally. We want people to be able to see it and we want to proclaim it. In verse 17, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing, that means stay connected. All right? There is good order to God's word. Isn't it interesting that Paul says, we, first he says we got to rejoice. And then he says we got to pray without ceasing. Why? Because, because doing this puts you in the proper attitude, attitude to go before the Lord. It's like the opening of the line of communication. It is. But it, it, what it does is that rejoicing puts the focus on the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to look at the Psalms and see how many of the Psalms start with, with David, for example, praising God, mm -hmm. then making his request made known, and then ending the Psalm by praising God once again. When Jesus taught the apostles how to pray, it doesn't start with, oh God, give me my, my bread. Hey, I'm hungry. It starts with, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The focus is on him before we, before we get to ourselves. And it, it's the same thing here. There's this, there's this good order. God is not a God of confusion, but a God of good order, the word says. So here's this good order. You're going to pray? Go into your prayer, your discuss, discussion with the Lord with a proper attitude. Okay? And if you're already given thanks, it's hard to go before the Lord doing what we say we're not supposed to do, grumbling or disputing. Because a lot of people I hear, I mean, I've been to a lot of prayer meetings in the last 35 years. And I had a lot of prayer. And gosh, it sounds very, very similar to grumbling and complaining yes. to me. Oh, God, why haven't you done this? Oh, God, why am I going through this? Oh, God, why? You're going in with the wrong attitude. That's not rejoicing. Okay? And if we go into prayer with an attitude, oh, God, do this for me, oh, God, do this for me. How about we go into prayer with an attitude of, oh God, what, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? It's not about us, it's about Him. Right? Because we have to believe that He is, as He said it, He is taking care of us. Everything right. that we need. But it's like we're always prepared to rejoice after God answers exactly. the prayer. Yeah. Yeah. But Paul put the rejoicing over here first. And I always use the example, Mark brought it up, talking about, about the Red Sea. God brings the people, leads the people to the Red Sea, out of, out of the bondage of Egypt and to the Red Sea, already having proclaimed that he's going to take them out into safety, into a promised land, right? Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, they get to the Red Sea and they begin to grumble and complain. When, you know, I'm cutting it short, but when God does that incredible, wonderful miracle that is registered throughout history and parts the water, and the people of God get to the other side, when they get to the other side, it says, go and check it out in Exodus. They sang and they danced and they had a jubilee. Well, the problem was they should have sang and danced and had a jubilee on the other side of the Red Sea. Because we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. They waited till after it was accomplished before they started to give glory to God for it. God is looking for us to give him thanks and praise and rejoice before the event. Because that's what's called faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and not seen. When he comes back, that's what he said. Well, I find faith. Will the Son of Man find faith? All right? So, think, just think about that. But by the way, prayer is not you talking to God. I, you know, so, so much. I mean, that's, okay, let's pray. And who's going to talk first? Prayer is talking with God. And you really need to spend time in your prayer life listening to the voice of the Lord. Because listening is what brings about that faith that we're talking about. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So logical. 
Faith doesn't come by you talking. Faith comes by you hearing. <coughs> and, you know, again, it's kind of what we're being conditioned with in the world. The people are very poor listeners. They really are. Because they'll sit there and they'll, uh, and they'll not only, if they're not talking, they're their mind is only thinking about what they're going to say. So they're not really paying attention to what's being said. <coughs> you know, I, I've trained a lot of salespeople in my life. And one of the things that, that I've had to train people to do is to learn to listen. Thanks, pal. Um, in Hebrews 5.14, it says that the solid food of the word is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern between good and evil. You need to train your senses. We don't... You came out into this world, into the light of day in this world, screaming, kicking, and hollering. Not listening. And it went downhill from there. <laughs> I mean, that's the human condition. All right? We are much better at talking than we are at listening. But I mentioned before Psalm 139, which says, We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you'll, you'll notice, I'll just zoom in here carefully. Being a, a typical human being, you will notice that God has given me one mouth, two ears. I should listen at least twice as much as I talk. Said by somebody who talks for her. Okay. Prayer is communication with the Lord. It's not just you talking to the Lord. You've got to do it without ceasing. If what I just said was not true, then what God has asked you to do through the Apostle Paul would be impossible. It's not impossible. Well, let me just ask you a question. How, when you go to sleep at night, are you going to continue to pray? Because otherwise, Paul doesn't mean pray without ceasing. He means pray most of the time, or pray all the time while you're awake. How can you pray without ceasing? 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Your spirit doesn't go to sleep. Because your spirit doesn't go to sleep. And God said, and listen, this is very scriptural. God can speak to you in your dreams. And we are the spirit. Yes, we are spiritual beings. Yeah, not this flesh that trapped, has to go to sleep. Trapped in the body. Yeah. So, but the point is, God can. If, if God speaks to you in, the, in your dreams, mm -hmm. you're still praying. Mark it up. That's that's part of your prayer life. I've, and Alison Mark can attest this. I mean, so many times I I pray for people that God would speak to them in their dreams. God, let God speak to you when you go to sleep tonight. You know, David said that he, when he went to sleep at night, when he lay down on the bed, he meditated on God's word. And maybe we spend a little more time meditating on God's word as we lay down to sleep. Maybe we would have a better attitude to be in prayer with God while our mind was unconscious and our spirit. Because you want to know something? Your spirit has no distraction because your body's not doing anything. Your body's not getting you in any trouble. So, your, But your spirit, spirits don't sleep. All right. Uh, this is, a, oh, goodness gracious. I've been waiting for this one. Verse 18, chapter 5, verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Is that also the, part, the three parts? Praise or rejoice, pray, and then give thanks? Is that like a set group there? Well, in a sense it is, but here, it, it, this, is, this is like kind of, I'm almost going to say it's like a recap of, of those things so far. Hmm. I've had so many people, and I've done a lot of pastoral counseling, I've done a lot of counseling. And people come to me and say, oh, I want to know God's will in my life. I want to know God's will in my life. You know, I'm seeking God's will in my life. Well, gosh, isn't it wonderful that we have a verse that says, okay, here's God's will in your life. Mm -hmm. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Well, you say, oh, no, no, that's not what I mean. I need no, no. Get this one down and the rest will follow. You know, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the rest shall be added unto you. It's like, take care of this, and the rest will take care of itself. If you start to be a, that person who gives thanks in all things, you're going to find that it's easy to know what God wants you to do. This is the 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. But it's interesting here, because I'm going to tell you, I know that Alice has had, uh, on occasion, some real confrontations with good Christian brothers and sisters. Because... Paul says here, 
in everything give thanks. But she'll say, well, not only in everything, but for everything. And people, whoa, no, not more. You know, this happened to me. You want me to give thanks for this? Absolutely. No, it's not. I don't. Who do you, what do you care what I want? But I'm going to tell you that Paul also wrote to the Ephesians. And he said, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So the Word of God does say, not only in everything, but for everything. Now, I use in my studies, I, I basically use a couple of translations all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I have, you know, the ones that I, but I, I use in my studies, I use 15 different translations of the Bible. And in 14 of those 15 translations of the Bible, it says, give thanks for all things, for all things, for all things, for all things. What's the 15? Take a wild guess. No, what does it say? I, I know no, which one it is. It's the big M. Yeah. The Message Bible. The Message Bible. What's that? Message it says, give thanks over all things. Now, that may sound over? close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know I'm going to the whole thing. But I just find it interesting because if you know me, you know that I am not a fan of the Message Bible. And that, my friend, is Listen. putting it mildly. Mild. Um, and if, if that troubles you or you want further explanation, write to me at office at BibleTalk.com. And I will send you the links to two hour-long studies I did on the Message of Bible. Am I prepared to say here that no, that I'm not going. No, I don't want to get into that and start saying that this is a straight from the pits of hell. Um, you did. Oh, excuse me. But it's interesting that out of 15 translations I used, that was the only one that did not say four. But this will never become a reality in your life if you think your life is all about you. Mm -hmm. It's not, you'll never be able to give thanks in everything and for everything until you realize that it's not about you. I, I, I've said this here so many times because I just love this. You know, in Psalm 23, everybody knows Psalm 23. The pagans know Psalm mm -hmm. 23. And it says, He guides me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Psalm 23, 3. It's for His name's sake. Think about this. I want to, I, we could spend days just going through different stories in the Bible, and I'm not going to do that because we're going to we'll run out of time. But I just want to throw these at you, and then we'll come back next week and we'll, uh, on our next episode of this study and go through these in detail. Joseph and his brothers in the book of Genesis. Right? God gives Joseph a vision of how he will be exalted and used. And his brothers throw him down a well. And after all of the whole story about all he goes through, the trials in the, in the well, being sold into slavery, going into Egypt, being thrown in jail, his brothers came, right, and, and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? I'm not God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. It was him getting thrown down into the well. It was him getting sold off into slavery. It was him winding up in jail in Egypt. That God meant. He didn't just use the occasion after the fact. He meant it for good to preserve many people alive. In John chapter 9, the man born blind, which, I mean, a story that I preach about frequently, right? If you remember this, the disciples and Jesus are passing, coming out of the temple, and they pass this man who has been born blind. He's never seen the light of day. And his disciples asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered and said, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. It wasn't about him. It's not a story of the blind man. It is a story of the Messiah who came to give sight to the blind. In John 11, the story of Lazarus, right? If you know the story of Lazarus, he, Jesus hears that he's sick. Jesus hears that he's dying, right? And the sisters, Martha and Mary, send word to Jesus saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. It wasn't about, it's not a story about Lazarus. It is a story about the Son of God. When Paul went to jail in Philippi, 
right? And that's what Mark was talking about in Acts chapter 16. Well, no, and then later on, now he's in jail in Rome, right? He's, Paul spent an inordinate amount of time in jail as the price of serving God. But when he was in jail, did he grumble? Did he complain? No, he did not. But it wasn't just that he was giving thanks in those situations. Listen to what he says, writing to the Philippians. I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Paul is saying, if it had not been for this, this would not have happened. But because this happened, the brothers and sisters are out there speaking the word of God boldly because they see how Paul is reacting to his prison. They couldn't chain his spirit. This all boils down to this is a test of whether you actually believe God's word or not. Whether you can give thanks in and for all things. It's it's a test of whether you believe the Word of God. Because I'm sure you've heard this verse. Every Christian I know has heard this verse. I say somewhat generously. We know, not that we think, not that it's a possibility, but Paul writes, we know that God causes all things to work for good, together for good, for those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. There is nothing in your life that will not work out for good. No matter how horrible it may seem. No. Regardless of what it appears like, Joseph was thrown down a well. Lazarus was put dead in a tomb. Paul was put into a prison. All those situations worked out for good. But you want to know something? It's not ultimately about your good. Ultimately, it's about His glory. And until that becomes your attitude, until you understand that your life is not your own, you were purchased with a price. You are here to serve God. Not for God to serve you. Even Jesus said that He came not, not to be served, but to serve. When we get this attitude in ourselves that was in Christ Jesus, and we begin to understand that our lives are about serving God, bringing glory to God, giving opportunity to God to use our lives in every circumstance in our lives, then not only will we give thanks in those situations, we'll begin to give thanks to God for those situations. Because we believe that He's going to take that situation, that very situation, and He's going to work out something that will work out for your good, but more importantly, it will work out for His glory. If you're complaining, if you're grumbling, you don't believe this. That's right. You can say you're a Bible-believing Christian, but you're not living this lifestyle that Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, here's what your life should look like while you wait for the return of Jesus Christ. You should be giving thanks no matter what's going on. Well, I pray that God will use your life until we meet again. That He will work your life for good because He desires to bless you. But more importantly, that He will use your life to bring glory to His name. And I rejoice in the fact that He can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. He can still use me. Hallelujah. Till next time, may God bless you. Come on. Is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Your word is a light into my path. Your word is a lamp into my feet. Help me.